Imagine the smile on your parents' face as you rush to meet them at the school gates. The soft heat of the sand between your toes on a first holiday. Waking up in the haze of a late afternoon after dancing all night. The drop in your stomach when you realize you'll never hear their voice again. These are conscious experiences. And in this sense, we all know what consciousness is and there's nothing we know more intimately. Yet it remains one of life's greatest mysteries. Despite the incredible advances made in physical science, it doesn't seem like we're any closer to an explanation of where consciousness comes from. How is it, exactly, that the brain's 86 billion neurons give rise to conscious experience? As we'll see, our answer to this question will not only shape our understanding of the human mind, but the fabric of reality itself. Hello and welcome to the Mystery of Consciousness here at Liverpool's beautiful Tunga Auditorium. Before we get going, a big thank you to the University of Liverpool's Department of Philosophy, Premier Christian Radio, and everybody at the Pansai Cast for making tonight's event possible. I'm the chemical scum that is Jack Symes, and I'm delighted to be joined once again by the man who is mad for his Madagascan dragon tree, Professor of Philosophy, Philip Goff. the dream machine neuroscientist, that is, Anil Seth. Staring into the void of empty space and silence, it's the University of Liverpool's very own Dr. Laura Gao. And last but not least, the holy trinity that is mind, brain and person, the 104th Archbishop of Canterbury, Professor Rowan Williams. It's great to have you with us this evening, Q Quartet. What a beautiful piece that was. A great conscious experience. Now, when these sound waves from the quartet's instruments go into the microphones, or these visual images go into the cameras in front of us, the microphones don't hear the sound, and the cameras don't see the images in front of them. And if there was a robot in the audience tonight, so I'm looking at the Pro Vice Chancellor over there, then the audio which their microphones receive and the visual images that they see, they don't experience them. The brain processing would be going on in the dark. But when sound waves hit my ears and visual images hit my eyes, there's something it's like to be me. I experience them. And that's consciousness. That's the missing ingredient between a robot and the person before you, and hopefully yourself as well so you can enjoy the show. We've got two reductionists who think that this consciousness is just a matter of physical properties. There's no special soul or non-physical consciousness in the world. It's all a matter of physics. And in the fullness of time, physics will explain consciousness. And then we have two non-reductionists, I, Rowan and Philip, who think the opposite. I know yours is probably a, a good place to start as a 
probably the, the intuitive view lots of people may hold in the audience. Do you want to kick us off? Well, thanks, thanks, Jack, and um, thank you for joining us. And thank you for joining us. Um, I should say, first of all, that I don't really think of myself as a reductionist, more as a materialist. And I, don't want to get, I do not want to get deep into the jargon here. But uh, the difference is that, that I think that consciousness, conscious experiences, which do seem very mysterious, stand the promise of being explained in terms of physical things, material things, the, the wetware inside our skulls, um, which is not to say that it's, it's like it's locatable in particular atoms and things like that. It could be an emergent property. It could be something that the collective has. Uh, but I do think that materialism well, is, is the way to go. And, and the reason I think this, what, what does it mean to be a materialist? It just means that. It means that we can usefully study and maybe come up with a satisfactory understanding of this central mystery of life in terms of physical mechanisms in the brain and in the body. And understanding mysterious phenomena in terms of physical things happening in the universe has served science and philosophy very, very well for hundreds and hundreds of years. And stuff that were, things that were supposed to, were, on the face of it, seemed beyond science, have proven not to be. And this has happened for life. It's happened for things like heat. It's happened time and time again. And we've been very successful in neuroscience in understanding many things about consciousness. We know which parts of the brain, when it comes to human consciousness, we know which parts of the brain are more involved than others. We know, for instance, that the cerebellum, which is this mini brain hanging off the back of your main brain, is not really involved in consciousness at all, yet it contains three quarters of all the neurons, all the brain cells that you have. That's always a surprising fact to me. We know a lot about the processes in brains, that are involved in consciousness, different patterns of activity that go along with different conscious states. We know what happens when people fall asleep and wake up. We understand more about which parts of the brain are involved in different kinds of experiences, in visual experience, in experiences of smell, of emotion. We now have a range of theories all grounded in different brain processes that explain different aspects of consciousness. And these theories are getting to the stage now where neuroscientists, me among them, are designing experiments which are, which are, are de developed to disambiguate, to test between these theories, to refine them and maybe rule some of these things out. This is a sign of a healthy science. And so it will go on. But you may wonder, there's always going to be something left out. Yes, you can explain which parts of the brain are involved or go along with consciousness. Yes, you can explain this kind of neuron or that kind of neuron. But you're not going to explain consciousness itself, this essential mystery of why anything should have the property of instantiating experiences. The hard problem of consciousness might remain. Okay, this is possible. So I wouldn't admit from the beginning that it's possible that we may not get there. But we have to be careful. Firstly, science in general doesn't always have to explain why a particular thing is part of the universe in the first place to be successful. Physics hasn't explained why there's a universe in the first place, yet it's done a remarkable job of explaining many things about the universe. Secondly, a scientific explanation doesn't have to be intuitively satisfying. It doesn't always have to give us the sense of like, ah, oh, yeah, now I get it. And sometimes objections to a science of consciousness take that form. It's like, I can't imagine any scientific explanation giving me the sense, yeah. But many things in science don't work like that. Quantum mechanics is notoriously non-intuitive. Nobody even agrees what it means, let alone it being intuitively satisfying. Why should an explanation of consciousness necessarily be intuitively satisfying? Perhaps we think that because we ourselves are conscious. So there are there are reasons we shouldn't set a, a higher explanatory standard for consciousness than for other things. But there still may be this, this, um, this gap. We, there may still be a residue of mystery. So the way, and this is where I'll, I'll kind of finish with, the way I think is a, the right way to go about studying consciousness from this perspective of materialism is by analogy with how we've come to understand life. It wasn't so long ago that biologists of the day thought that life could not be explained in terms of 
physical material stuff, physics and chemistry. It wasn't up to the job. There had to be something else. There had to be a spark of life, an elan vital, that magicked life out of mere mechanism. But of course, things didn't turn out that way as biologists got on with the job of not treating life as a single big scary mystery, but dividing it up into its properties, metabolism, homeostasis, reproduction, self-repair, and explaining them bit by bit. The hard problem of life didn't, wasn't solved, it was dissolved. And we, now, we don't understand everything about life, surely not, but the conceptual mystery that there's something inexplicable in material terms about life, that's no longer there. And nobody found the, the spark of life, the elan vital, nor do we pretend that life doesn't exist. We naturalize life by dividing and conquering. And so instead of the hard problem of consciousness, I think we should focus on what I've called the real problem of consciousness. And many people do this anyway. It's instead of treating consciousness as one big scary mystery, how is it that a table is unconscious but Philip is conscious, potentially? <laughs> um, we should say, in what ways is Philip conscious? What are the properties of the conscious experiences that he have? He can be awake or asleep. He can make voluntary actions. He can think philosophical thoughts. He can have complicated emotions. We can explain each of those, and we have the resources to do this within neuroscience, physics, philosophy, computer science, and we, we make progress. Will we get all the way? I still don't know. It is true there may be a residue of mystery left. One of the problems, one of the reasons the analogy is not perfect is that consciousness is intrinsically private, subjective. I have my conscious experiences. I can tell you about them, but you do not know what it is like to be me. But this is just primarily a problem that it's hard to get the data. We can't put a conscious experience on the table. Um, but that is not an object. That's no objection to following this line. So we may not get there, but my contention is that we will discover a lot more about consciousness by following this route, by treating it as a natural phenomenon that's part of life, part of the wider pattern of nature, and that's a very rewarding thing to do. And my hope is if we don't solve it, what will happen is that Years down the line, we'll think of the problem very differently, as biologists now think of the problem of life very differently, and that in itself will be progress. So you think quite the opposite to uh, Anil Philip, it's fair to say. Do you, do, you, do you think he's, obviously you don't think he's right, but what do you take to the school? You just need to be more patient, that eventually neuroscience might get there and you're, you jump in the gun. Yeah, I think, I think maybe the fundamental disagreement between me and Anil is that He's approaching it as a purely scientific problem. I think it's partly a scientific problem, but I think it's also partly a philosophical problem. And the reason for that is that consciousness is not a publicly observable phenomenon. I can't look inside Anil's brain and see his feelings and experiences. Consciousness isn't something we discovered in looking down a microscope or in a particle collider. We know about consciousness, not from experiments, but from our immediate awareness of our own feelings and experiences. If you're in pain, you're just immediately aware of your pain. Uh, so this is why I think the, the analogy with life is not a good one, because that was a purely scientific question. It was about explaining pub the, the, the functions of biological organisms, this publicly accessible uh, data about living organisms. That's what science is about, explaining publicly ex accessible data. Um, but that's fundamentally not what we're trying to do in this case. We're trying to, the, the thing we are trying to explain is not publicly accessible. And that's what makes it, I think, a radically different kind of explanatory project. It's not just that the data are hard to get, it's a radically different explanatory project from what we standardly do in science, which is about accounting for the data of observation and experiments. Here we're trying to account for something invisible, something that's only accessible from the inside by the person having the experience. Now, this is not to say that the science is, of course, incredibly important, and Anil is a, a wonderful exponent of it. And sometimes we've debated before, and he, he, it's, it's like he, he thinks I'm trying to stop him doing what he's doing. <laughs> That's not at all. He does wonderful science, and that's all crucial. 
Uh, so how is the science possible if this is not observable? Because if you're dealing with another human being, you can't see their experiences, but you can ask them, or you can look for external markers. And if you do that while you're scanning their brain, you can start to identify correlations, which <coughs> kinds of brain activity go along with which kinds of conscious experience. And you can get more systematic about this. And that's fantastic, and that's all really important. I, you know, I, I don't challenge any of the science Anil does. But that's not a full theory of consciousness. What we ultimately want from a theory of consciousness is an explanation why, why these kinds of brain activity go along with conscious experience. Why should that, what is going on in reality to account for that? He made the analogy to quantum mechanics. It's a similar situation in quantum mechanics that the, the equations work really well and so much of our technology is based on it. What we don't know is what the hell is going on in reality <laughs> to make those equations work. And a lot of scientists get uncomfortable with this and just say, just, it works, just get on with it. This is a shut up and calculate approach. But a lot of us wanna say, no, we wanna, what is going on in reality to account for this? And because consciousness is not publicly observable, I don't think that question can be answered with an experiment. So at that point, we have to do some philosophy. We have to examine the various theories philosophers have proposed as to how the mental and the physical relate to each other. And broadly speaking, there are three options. One, materialism, the view Laura and Emile like. Uh, <laughs> roughly the view that you know, the fundamental story of reality is what you get from physics. Particles, fields, that kind of thing. And everything else, including consciousness, emerges from physics. Second option, panpsychism, the one I favor, turns that on its head. On this view, the fundamental story of reality is concerns mind or consciousness, and everything else, including physics, emerges from that fundamental story of mind and consciousness. So actually, Jack said, I'm, I'm, I'm not a reductionist. I am a reductionist. I just turn the reduction on its head. I would try to reduce everything to mind and consciousness, which turns out to be surprisingly easy to do. That's what I think. Okay, so the, the third option is dualism, the view that both mind and matter are radically different but equally fundamental uh, aspects of reality. So how do we decide between these? I say you can't do it with an experiment. All three are totally compatible with all of the scientific hypotheses Anil defends. So the science is wonderful, but it just is neutral on the philosophical question of which of those theories is correct. My own view is that the first theory, materialism, is just incoherent. That when you carefully reflect on matter, on, on, the, on the situation, which is the particular skill of a philosopher, it just turns out we just can't make a coherent sense of the idea that the subjective qualities of my experience could be wholly accounted for in the purely quantitative vocabulary of neuroscience. I just don't think that makes any sense upon reflection. Dualism, I think, is a coherent possibility. It might be true. But as scientists and philosophers, we, we respect Occam's razor. We try to have the simplest theory of reality possible. And all things being equal, it's better to just believe in one kind of stuff than two, as the dualist does. So that leaves panpsychism, which I think is a coherent, wonderfully simple theory able to account both for the uh, quantitative data of physical science and the qualitative reality of consciousness, does the job, feels a bit weird, but you know, cultural prejudices of the day has had a great history uh, in Western and Eastern philosophy prior to the latter half of the 20th century, does the job, and on that basis, I think it is the most plausible theory, <laughs> philosophical theory of consciousness, and probably true. So Philip was just saying, as, as philosophers, it's for us to weigh up these different, or three different positions as Philip's articulated them. And it also gave us his perspective from uh, neuroscience and working in philosophy as well. You're pure philosophy, aren't you? So how is it you've ended up on an ill side of the table rather than Philip's? That's, that's a good question. So, 
I, I agree with Anil that physicalism, I call it physicalism, is the way to go. But I would say that I don't think this is something that scientists are ever going to prove. So scientists are never going to prove or, dis or discover you know, that consciousness is a neural process, say. So, it's, so although I think the empirical work can teach us a huge amount about consciousness, the identification of consciousness with the neural process isn't going to come through science. In a way, I kind of think it's a decision. So with life, which is what um, Anil was talking about, we didn't like discover that life was these biological processes. After a while, we just decided to regard life as these biological processes. It was like it was a decision. We had all the information we needed. We didn't need, feel the need to postulate something over and above the biological processes. So I kind of think we're never going to discover that neural processes are conscious. We're going to have to decide that they are. So in a way, we can do that like in this room right now and decide that physicalism is true because it's going to have to come about through, through looking at the good reasons there are to be a physicalist and uh, to think that everything is you know, made of the same fundamental stuff and to not encounter those problems that dualists have. Um, and so we're going to have to just decide that an identity is the best explanation of, uh, of the constant correlations that we get between neural processes and consciousness. And in, quickly in response to panpsychism, so I don't think, like lots of people reject panpsychism because they think it's this uh, sort of outlandish, wacky view and it's super counterintuitive. And in a way, so I don't think that's true. Um, the reason I'm not a panpsychist is I don't think it makes any progress at all on the hard problem. It, I don't think it has any advantage over physicalism, actually. So the situation is, you know, you've got these conscious subjects of experience, like us and animals, and you've got non-conscious entities, like tables and chairs. Now, even the panpsychist thinks that there's nothing it's like to be a table. So the table, as, a, as, an, as an entity, is not itself conscious. There's nothing it's like to be a table. We've got non-conscious entities. But so you've got the conscious entities on one hand, and you've got these non-conscious entities, like tables and chairs, on the other. Now, both panpsychists and physicalists agree that the fundamental level of reality is made of the same stuff, yeah? So physicalists say, Fundament, the fundamental level of reality is non-conscious fundamental particles, and you can put them together in ways to make conscious things like us and non-conscious things like tables and chairs. The panpsychist agrees that at the fundamental level of reality, you've got one kind of stuff. They just think it's simple consciousnesses. That's what you've got at the fundamental level, simple consciousnesses. So you can see they're also going to have to say that conscious stuff like us, and non-conscious stuff, like tables and chairs, are built out of the same kind of thing. And I think that's where the weirdness comes in. And both physicalism and panpsychism, because they're structurally so similar, they're actually going to have parallel problems. So the physicalist has the problem of explaining how you can put this fundamental non-conscious stuff together to get conscious stuff. None of us think it's a problem that you can get non-conscious tables and chairs out of non-conscious stuff, okay? So for the physicalist, they have, you know, this, is, this micro to macro story is problematic. How can you build consciousness out of non-conscious fundamental particles? But notice the panpsychist has the exact parallel problem. So on the panpsychist view, it's very intuitive to think conscious subjects of experience like us are made of these simple consciousnesses but then it becomes really weird. How on earth do you build non-conscious tables and chairs out of consciousness? So I guess, so I've sort of explained why I'm a, why I'm a physicalist and said something about why I don't think panpsychism, uh, it's not this really outlandish, radical view. It actually is structurally exactly the same as physicalism. So it has no advantage over physicalism, as far as I can tell. So I guess I'd better stop there. So just before we jump yeah. over to Rowan, is it fair to say then that the problem as it's usually stated is there's physical stuff, how does this seemingly non-physical thing arise, i.e. consciousness? Mm -hmm. And you're saying Philip turns that on its head and faces the same problem. Yeah. There's conscious stuff, now how does that form tables and chairs? And that seems equally as problematic. Yeah, on the panpsychist world when you've got everything being made out of 
simple consciousness is. Th this one isn't a problem. It's not a problem explaining how you can get our conscious subjects, you know, our conscious subjectivity from that. Right. But it is a problem of explaining how you can build a non-conscious table and chair from consciousness. Okay, so you have good. the exact same problem, it's just the opposite, the mirror image problem, I guess. Well, when you've got such a difficult problem, it's good to look to the heavens <laughs> and the holy to find the solution. Uh, Rowan, what do you make of all this? Well, um, to begin with, I'm, I'm going to disappoint people by not being a duoist, I think, because that's, that's how the conversation has always been set up so far. Um, but no, I don't have a problem myself in the idea that, in some sense, what is, is the same kind of stuff. My problem is what we mean by stuff there. And quite often, um, there's a kind of popular materialism, which nobody this evening has been defending, which suggests that stuff is just that. It's kind of lumps of hard material lying around bumping into each other. That's clearly not what we're talking about. But what if we were talking about a world in which there were a huge spectrum of different levels of complex informational energy being exchanged. It's, as you might say, information all the way down. It's not a matter of consciousnesses plus chairs and tables that we're dropping from heaven. It's a matter of complex forms of physical being developing, combining, becoming more complex, and rather mysteriously, which is our problem tonight, rather mysteriously, developing this capacity of a sort of feedback, of a self-reflexive dimension to what they are, what they do, what, how they behave. So I see a, a continuity through all this of that energy which exchanges information as the fundamental pattern of what there is. Now, I don't know, I, I suspect that puts me a bit closer to Philip than to Laura and Daniel, but they will doubtless tell me that where I'm or I've misread that, but that's where I'd start. And that would lead me on to, I think, a second set of questions, which again reflect a little bit what Philip was saying. What kind of question is it that we're asking about consciousness? I was entirely in sympathy with what Anil said about the different sorts of question that there are. I find what little I know of neuroscientific research at the moment is among the most intellectually exciting areas of the world of research and scientific discourse at the moment, precisely because there are so many different sorts of question being asked. If we, so to speak, cut to the chase and say, yes, but what is consciousness? What kind of question is that and what difference does an answer make? Something which I think is always worth asking philosophically is what difference does the answer make? Because that helps you, I think. Um, work out what sort of a question you're asking in the first place. It's been said sometimes that you can't, you can't think about anything that you can only think about. You have to ask what, what's the difference that a, an answer might make. And sometimes the apparently hard question of consciousness is put in such a form that it's not at all clear what you're asking, what would count as a good answer, and what difference would, would emerge. Because going back to this question of explanation, which has been around quite a bit in the discussion so far. If a child of seven or eight asks, why am I me? You understand that's quite, a, quite an important question to ask, but I'm not at all sure that an adult could or should try to provide an explanation that would satisfy the child. The, the asking of the question, as it were, flows into a whole sequence of thinking, imagining, picturing, storytelling in the process of human development, which has a role rather different from why does the kettle boil? And so I want, I want to keep some focus on that issue of the sorts of question we're asking, the sorts of question that can and can't be actually answered with an explanation. I'm fascinated by this language about deciding. I think that Laura's right in saying that there is clearly an element of that involved here. It's not as if, going back to Philip's point, consciousness, or indeed a good many other things, can simply be put on the table in a way which allows us to say, well, there it is, there's your evidence. Um, I often used to quote with students, 
or a photo rather, a, a New Yorker cartoon many years ago, which showed somebody driving a car into a garage. He opens up the, the bonnet of the car and shows the, the mechanic what's inside. Inside is a small hairy goblin. And the car mechanic says to the car owner, well, there's your problem. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's quite how this, this works. We don't have that kind of problem sitting there in front of us. We have a set of issues about how we organize the way we talk about certain phenomena. And those decisions are, you might say, cultural as much as they're strictly intellectual or explanatory. And that, I suppose, is where, as, as a theologian, as well as somebody with interests in philosophy, I, I want to say a little bit about what enables us to tell the stories we tell about ourselves um, in the light of my belief in God. But that's, that's another story, and I don't think comes directly into this one. The point is, how we make our decisions will depend on quite a lot of things that are not, as has been said, directly determined by sets of clear evidence. We come back again and again, in my mind, to the sorts of question we're asking. And perhaps above all, to what seems to me a very interesting point um, in intellectual discourse generally, um, are only some sorts of questions worth asking. And the risk of what what's been called a reductionist approach, and I absolutely understand why any others resisted that sort of language. The risk of a reductionist approach is saying, well, only some kinds of questions are worth asking. And in fact, experience suggests that that's not a very sensible way to, to start in on this. So yes, that's just a few responses to what's been said so far and thoughts of my own. Thank you. That's right. We'll come back to, to you, Anil. If I could poke you on something you said right at the very beginning. You drew an analogy with the origin of the universe. And you said, we don't know how the universe came about, but we know lots of things about the origin of the universe. I couldn't help but think that, well, we don't know what caused the universe. We don't know how the universe came into being. And that's a similar problem, isn't it, to the consciousness one. We can say lots of things about consciousness or the origin of the universe, but we don't know why there's a universe and we don't know why there's consciousness. And Philip says, your view will never be able to answer that question. Well, I didn't talk about so much about the origin of the universe, but the, but the nature of it. So right. physics doesn't tell us why there is a universe at all, um, mm -hmm. let alone the, the, why its origin was the way it was. But physics has told us a lot about the nature of it, what happens. It's, it's so much more marvelous than we could have thought, so much bigger and vaster. And, and this, this is actually picking up on Rowan's very well put um, main thought there that it's all about the value of the questions that you ask. And physics, if it had struggled with, like, why is there a universe, would not have given us all the wonders that physical science has done. Um, and the same thing, you know, I think goes for, for consciousness too. You can ask why in several senses, of course. You can ask why evolutionarily, like, as a biological phenomenon, why is it that we have experiences? Now, there are some good answers to that but they're not actually very easily testable in experiments, but nothing in evolution is very easily testable in experiments. Um, so that's, you know, that's okay, but we can come up with good explanations for why we should be conscious in terms of biology. Um, but it does come down to the questions. I actually agreed with, with, uh, with Laura. You were supposed to be on my side, and you spent like, the first, <laughs> first half like, explaining why you were. Uh, but I, I did sort of agree with you that we, you know, it's not about proof. You know, I don't think... Yeah. And I, but that's not necessarily the goal. It's not like a mathematical proof or that, that we're after or ultimate decidability about something. Um, it's about you know, the explanatory value and about evidence, the weight of evidence, too. It's very rarely rigorous proof in, in science. Um, and Philip is right that these three different... You're right about one thing. I'll give you that. You're, that these three <laughs> different perspectives, um, panpsychism, materialism... And dualism, at one level they're equally compatible. Uh, but, and you say panpsychism, panpsychism does the job, but I'm not sure what job it does or how it, how it does it, because then we come back to Rowan's point about the questions that you ask, the value of asking questions, and what you get from them. None of these frameworks are in themselves testable. Like, you cannot do an experiment to show that materialism is true. 
cannot do an experiment to show that panpsychism is true or that dualism is true. Um, what it, for me, what it comes down to is what is the most fact productive, useful, what delivers them the greatest insight into the phenomenon, which approach. Now, materialism has generated a lot of insight. No experiment proves that it itself is true, but it has generated an enormous amount of insight to the kinds of questions that are not the single big scary mystery question of consciousness. But why is one experience the way it is and not another way? Why are some perceptions conscious and others not? Why do I have an experience of free will when I do something of my own volition? We can, why do I lose consciousness when I fall asleep? Lots of questions, why are conscious experiences unified and integrated? And it's not that these just purely follow from experiments. No, they involve philosophy too. So actually, this is something I did disagree with you at the beginning, where you kind of cast me as a scientist who ignores philosophy, and then there's philosophy. No, no, no. I mean, science and philosophy go together all the time. And um, without philosophy, science would get nowhere. But equally, without science, I think philosophy will not get very far either. I think this one's for you, Philip. Yeah, I mean, again, I always feel, I know you, you think it's like an either or. You know, you ask wh which questions are productive. Look how productive the science has been. I, I'm, I, I'm not stopping you doing this. I, I, my point is, the scientific hypotheses you defend are neutral between all the philosophical options. A dualist like David Chalmers, who's very knowledgeable on the science, can interpret your hypotheses in a dualist term. But they're not going to come up with them. That's the point. They're not going to derive the hypotheses from these bases. They, they come from a well, materialist that's, perspective. I, that's where I disagree with you. I don't think science is inherently materialist. I think there could be uh, your dualist twin, Anil, who would do all the same things you do um, you know, for, let me take one yeah, example of, of your, 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 your work that, without getting too technical, because I'd probably get out of my depth, you know, there's, there's this correspondence between the content of consciousness and predictive processing in the brain, mm -hmm. which is one thing you defend. David Chalmers, as a dualist, and I've spoken to him about this, would say, so he thinks the mental and the physical are separate, but they're connected by special laws of nature. He calls them psychophysical laws that connect the mental and the physical. He will just interpret that as a, a, a view about how the psychophysical laws work. Or if Laura, as a materialist, she can accept the view and just identify <coughs> the experience with the predictive processing in the brain. So that's what I mean. We need both the science and the philosophy plugged together to yield a full explanation. What I think you're adopting is a particular philosophical position called scientism, which is very much, the, in some ways, the religion of our times, that all question, the only real questions are scientific questions. And, I mean, an extreme this is like, you know, Sam Harris, who thinks science will answer all ethical questions. We sh maybe we should be doing experiments to find out whether abortion is permissible or something. You know, experiments are very important to science, but there are some questions that are not scientific questions, but are nonetheless worth asking. And I think in the area of philosophy, because consciousness is not publicly observable, um, you, you need both a scientific and a philosophical answer working together, would be my view. Do you want to jump in a little? Well, I think we all agree, actually, on that, really, <laughs> that you do need, I mean, I phrase it in slightly different ways, like you need, you need science to show I suppose that there are correlations and then you need philosophy in a way. It needs to be a kind of a philosophical idea that the best explanation of this is to identify the conscious process with the neural process. Uh, Occam's razor pushes for that too and it, is, it seems to be the best and most simplest um, explanation. Um, I would say that... <sighs> I'm kind of tempted towards the idea that philosophy can sort of rule out substance dualism, just because, for me, my understanding of what being physical means is to have causally, to be causally efficacious. So if something, you know, physics tells us there's all these kind of weird and wonderful things out there that behave in these weird and wonderful ways, but they all get to count as physical because they have uh, cause, and, cause and effects. They have causes and they have effects. So, and in a way, I think we define um, 
we say if something has a causal impact on the physical world, then it is by definition physical. So in a way, we can't really make conceptual space for the idea that there's something non-physical that has causes and effects. Because in having causes and effects, it by definition just becomes physical. That's why we know, I don't know, the Higgs boson is physical. You know, you can't see it and touch it, but it has causes and effects. It could be measured. Once something can be measured, it therefore it becomes, it comes into the realm of the physical. So I think that's a kind of philosophical reason for rejecting the idea that you could have a non-physical, causally efficacious subject. Uh, uh. Can we go over to Rowan here? Uh, Rowan, um, did, yes. what, uh, a quick follow-on from what Laura said. I, I actually rather agree with that. Um, I, I think there are real philosophical issues about substance dualism for the simple reason that uh, in order to distinguish between different kinds of causes, physical and non-physical, we would need to use the sort of criterion we could only use as between different physical causes. Or at least that's, that's how I would read the problem. And that, that still sticks with me as a problem about plain old-fashioned dualism. But I want to go back for a moment just to the question of philosophy and the role of philosophy, and suggest that one of the things that philosophy sometimes does, or should be able to do for science, is to point out to the scientist how they're using their language Sometimes one of the difficulties that arises in debates of this sort is people on both sides not quite knowing where we're deploying metaphors and allowing metaphors to run away with us. And some of the most interesting work in the philosophy of science in the last half century or so has been on the, on the role of metaphor and model in scientific um, hypothesis construction. So there are times when I think it's quite proper for the philosopher to say, for example, you are using such and such a term as if it designated a sort of real agent, a thing. I, I think here of um, Richard Dawkins' selfish gene. And again, another point I sometimes make with students is you could come away from that brilliant book thinking that things were full of little blokes called genes who went around pulling levers. Actually, this is a metaphor that's slightly run away with itself. And the philosopher can quite reasonably say, oh, hang on. Um, you are, in fact, describing a whole series of capacities, even emotions, to this um, convenient heuristic sort of standing term, a gene, which, which signals a particular complex of information transmission. And you're treating it as if it were, indeed, a little bloke. Um, so the philosopher has some critical questions to ask, just as the scientist, I think, quite reasonably has questions to put back about what sense is being made. And the most interesting dialogues between philosophy and science, it seems to me, are often at that level of, of the kind of language we're using and what sense we're prepared to make of it. So, um, no, I don't think science settles philosophical questions, nor does philosophy settle scientific questions in its own terms. But the discussion can be, I think, a constructive reminder of how we forget sometimes the sort of language we're using, how we can slip into a kind of new mythology, actually, if we're not careful. And there are, there are varieties of scientific reductionism or scientistic reductionism, to pick up Philip's point, which actually do land us with another kind of mythology if we're not careful. So, yeah, a role for philosophy there, maybe. Yeah, I, think we, I do think we all agree that philosophy is, of course, very important. And this is fundamentally, a philosoph always was a philosophical question, as also a, a spiritual and religious question about consciousness, too. It's not something that is purely within the domain of, of science. But there's also more, much more to philosophy than just deciding about one's stance. Is materialism true? Is panpsychism true? Is dualism true? And um, you know, a, a really important branch of philosophy that, that has not come up yet that you know, I certainly engage with on a daily basis is phenomenology. So phenomenology is the branch of philosophy that's all about what, what does it mean to say that we have an experience of a particular kind? Like, how do I describe what the character of my visual experience is like? Or the passing of time? What is that like? You know, it has a, a slippage into the past and the future. Uh, there's, I think this, this part of Philosophy is, in, is so important in consciousness because it, it, ensures again, it ensures us against, in Rowan's terms, us asking the wrong question because we can 
too quickly asked the wrong question about it. How does the brain generate this magic consciousness stuff? Um, whereas if we un and treat it as this one, like, one thing that we want to understand, how, did, how does this happen? But consciousness is infinitely richer than that, has many properties, and philosophy is extremely useful in, in delineating them, giving us you know, the framework, and, and keeping also, as you rightly say, keeping scientists conceptually on track and so that we don't misuse our language in overclaiming or overstating the reach of the theories that we develop. I, I think that the reference there to phenomenology really uh, cheers me because one of the things I, I've learned over the years from studying a bit of that sort of literature is that it, it helps to keep at arm's length the idea that there is a perfectly simple and uniform set of stimuli which are thrown at this kind of wax surface somewhere inside us and stick yeah. impressions, <clears throat> sense impressions. And the good phenomenologist will say, actually, we can't reduce our experience to a set of neatly separable, determinable sense impressions. We, we project, we experiment with how we see things, we learn how to see things, we learn directionality, dimensionality in the world, we, we encounter we find our way around things as we grow, and we do that not just in the medium of touch, but also in the medium of listening to the words people use and the maps people draw for us. So it's absolutely a crucial element in, if you like, locating the scientific enterprise in a more broad and more flexible framework of thinking about how we know things, and therefore absolutely vital to this enterprise in this conversation. Yeah, I think this is maybe a point of we're agreeing too much, aren't we? I think the, the because I think because consciousness is something we have a certain grip on from the inside, as it were. Um, this is another way in which it's it's different to other scientific questions where it's just ex explaining the data from experiments. Um, and then this, if I could just disagree with Laura, I agree with you on other things, but. Laura's idea that we can just decide the truth here. I mean, because I think there are things we know about consciousness on the inside. When we attend to our consciousness, we find these qualities, colors, sounds, smells, tastes. And I think we want an explanation of those. We want to know why do itches feel the way they do? Why does the red experiences have that reddish quality? We want, we want an explanation of that. We can't just sort of decide there's an explanation of it. And I, I, my view is because physical science works with a purely quantitative vocabulary, you just can't even articulate these qualities in that kind of vocabulary. You can't capture the, you know, the, in an equation, the deep red you experience as you watch the setting sun. So because of the limitations of the vocabulary that you just cannot mm. give the explanation that's needed in the terms of physical science. And just quickly, uh, the point I argue in my book is that is we shouldn't be surprised because Galileo, 400 years ago, designed physical science. He wanted it to be purely quantitative and mathematical. He said, well, you need to take these qualities we find in experience out of the picture if we want science to be purely mathematical. That was a good move. It went, science has gone really well, and now we think, oh, it's gone really well. It's going to explain consciousness. <laughs> the irony is it's gone really well because it was designed right. to exclude consciousness. Sorry, talk you, too you long. started that by saying you're all agreeing, and then halfway <laughs> through that, <laughs> and Neil Laura got very upset simultaneously. <laughs> so, so well, well done for, for stopping very that trend. Excited. Laura, do you want to jump in okay. first, and Neil can follow? Thank you. Um, so uh, sometimes physicalism is described as the view that everything could be explained or described in the language of physics. And I just want to point out that I don't think that would be that would be an example of an explanatory reduction, you know, when you, you explain one thing in terms of from another discipline. And I think you can believe that consciousness is a neural process, even if you don't think you can talk about consciousness um, in the language of physics. Like, for example, I don't think we can talk about photosynthesis in the language of physics, in this mathematical language that physics uses. I don't think we can talk about um, uh, photosynthesis in a way that's going to be, in a way that we're going to find acceptable. So you might be able to give an explanation on one level, but it's not an explanation that we're going to find acceptable. So just because you can't talk about consciousness in the language of physics doesn't mean that 
at the level of reality, what you actually have is just physical stuff, because explanations are human things. You know, we create hum explanations for a purpose, and we get to decide whether they're good explanations or not. So this is kind of operating at a different level from what we, the nature of reality is actually like. So I just guess I wanted to keep those two things clear. And I think you're going to have the final word here of this portion of the. Okay, well I'm going to try and hand to signify <laughs> okay. the interval of quite a while ago, but okay. I didn't want to stop us mid-flow. So. Well, I think I'm now going to disagree with everybody, uh, apart from <laughs> apart from maybe Rowan, which is surprising. Um, uh, and the, the the reason I got a little bit agitated a minute ago was was this idea that you cannot say anything sort of quantitative about the redness of red or why experiences are the way they are. And I think that's, I think you can. And I think that's, there's no, it, you can't necessarily do it exhaustively, but you can. We have things like color spaces. Some colors are more similar to each other than other colors. Uh, and they're both more similar to each other than they are to an experience of smelling a fish, for instance. And a great deal of progress, and this is where I disagree with you, I think you can use the language of physics to describe experiences in a way that's not complete yet, but, it, but there's no reason that it can't get quite far. Um, it's entirely possible to be quantitative about experience, even though experience is private. And I will agree, and I've always said, that the big challenge is that conscious experiences are private. They are subjective. This is a big obstacle to any scientific project that relies on gathering data. Um, but I don't want to pretend that, you know, Mapping color spaces is exhaustive. It isn't. Mm -hmm. you know, it depends on the question you have. If I want to answer the question, why am I me? You know, that is going to require a different level of explanation than, than is, it's not going to make sense, even if there is ultimately a materialistic basis for it. It's not a useful ex answer to that question in the same way that if I want to know like, why my computer keeps crashing, you know, it's, it's some error in the software. It's, it doesn't doesn't help me to understand how all the electrons are flowing. That's the wrong level of explanation, even though it's a material um, phenomenon. But let me just finish by complete, the, 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 since you mentioned the panpsychism again, and this, this notion that Galileo made this error, uh, which is now fixed by panpsychism by making consciousness the intrinsic nature of everything, well, the big problem for me with that is that it entirely makes it useless because if you define consciousness as the intrinsic nature of everything that can have no, you know, that, that you know, doesn't have effects on other things, you know, because if it does, then it's not the intrinsic nature of it, um, then you can never, it can never generate any testable prediction. So that's one issue I see with that way of putting panpsychism. If you divide like science and Galileo stuff is all about stuff that has effects on stuff, mechanisms and things, and, but doesn't say anything about the intrinsic nature of something, and you define that as consciousness, well then, you don't really define it in a way that can make any difference to, to anything. And then we come back to this, like, what is likely in the long run to shed light on something that may well remain a philosophical mystery for the next 50, 100 years? And we all want to see progress. And that involves philosophy and science and spirituality too. I'm going to leave you on the back foot here, but you can pick up at the start of after the interval okay. before we jump into the <laughs> Q&A. So you've got a good 15 minutes to plan, my answer. To plan your rebuttal. Uh, you mentioned Philip Goff's book, Galileo's Error there, and your book being you. I know the cover's very <laughs> similar. <laughs> this is true. This the is real true. mystery is, <laughs> have they run out of ideas at the publishing company, or is it yeah. just a really, is it like... Is no, it totally ran out of ideas. It's telepathy. Who was there, who was there first? Philip. It was, was me, it? but yeah. I, I think it was just kind of... <coughs> it's just you hadn't read my book, you see, so... You know. <laughs> oh, I had, I had. <laughs> yeah, you, you'd, yeah. read, oh, you'd read the American yeah, yeah, yeah. copy, hadn't you? No, I'd read the, pr I'd read the, pre the, the bound oh, the, proof. The yeah, pre no, I'd read it. Okay. Yeah. Well, didn't have a cover. It's They're a both available sign. at the front. Uh, don't get them confused. They'll separate them across <laughs> the table. Uh, join us in 15 minutes after the interval. You can stay and listen to the beautiful music of the Q Quartet, or you can make your way into the foyer. We might be wandering around up there. Come and say hello or visit the table to pick up a copy of one of the books. Thank you for joining us again. We'll see you in 15 minutes' time. <laughs> what do we do now? <laughs> <laughs>
put your hands together again for all of our lovely guests. First of all, Philip Goff. <laughs> Laura Gao and Anil Seth. Uh, now, just uh, before the uh, interval rudely <coughs> interrupted us, uh, Philip, I think you had something you wanted to say. Yeah, if I could. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose I partly wanted to agree with Anil that. Um, Yes, there are many things we can capture about the structure of our experience in quantitative terms, in the ways he articulated the various color similarity spaces of colors. But I don't think you can fully convey that the qualities that fill out that structure, you couldn't convey to a blind neuroscientist what it's like to see red, that the redness of the red experience. And this is not because we haven't done enough experiments, it's because you've just got two very different kinds of concept here. The, you know, the concepts you have in physical science are sort of, broad, broadly speaking, behavioral concepts. They de describe what, what systems do and what their parts do. Whereas if you think about the qualities, the, sorry, the concepts we use when we think about our experience, the, 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 the redness of a red experience, smells, tastes, these aren't behavioral <coughs> concepts in any sense. And so they're just very different kinds of concept. And I think because of that, you you can't build the kind of explanatory bridges between the two that I think Anil would like to. I mean, you can build some explanatory bridges, but I think, as he said, it, it's not going to be exhaustive. I mean, I think this is probably where me and Laura would, ag would agree that there is very different kinds of concept. Where I disagree with Laura is it seems to me her position is sort of just giving up on explanation. It's sort of, it's just a kind of brute identity and that's the end of it. So I think actually they're both half right. So if you go with Anil, that we do need explanations, but you go with Laura, that you know these are just radically different kinds of concept, and so this isn't the kind of explanation physical science, even in principle, could deliver, then you get my position, which is fully right. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Um, Ro Rowan, is, is Philip fully right, do you think? Pretty much, I think. Um, <laughs> explanation there you go. is Let's not go. the only thing we do with, with phenomena. We, we pattern them, we interpret them, we share them, we explore them, we revise them, and so forth. And I think that, as, as I suggested earlier on, really, what needs and what deserves explanation is, of course, not the whole of what we encounter, which is why there's no one discourse that does all the work for us. So yes, I, I go along with it to that extent. Uh, Laura, Philip said that your idea was half right. Can you tell us why he's completely wrong? Well, I sort of tried to do that earlier, really. <laughs> uh, um, I guess I could say something about, I wanted to say something earlier about reduction and how, so there's this idea that reductionists uh, are doing something really bad or something, that they're kind of, and our everyday, when we use the word reduction in everyday language, we always mean getting rid of something don't we? Like if you reduce the price of something, it costs less, yeah? So reduction in everyday language means you're getting rid of something. And so when people say, you know, about me being a physicalist, oh, you're a redu reductionist about consciousness, there's this idea that you're losing something. And I think, like Philip said, that's where I agree with him. I think there is, you know, something it's like to see red and that can't be captured in a way that uh, would make us happy in the language of physics, in mathematical language, but that's not to say that it isn't itself a physical thing. It's a neural process. And whether we can talk about something in a fully satisfactory way or not is, is another question, I think. So, so my kind of reduction, it's, it's an identity. So I'm saying consciousness, it really is. It's, you know, it is what it is. It's lovely and special and, and feels like it feels, but it is a neural process. So we don't, we're not losing anything. Just like when we reduced water to H2O, we didn't get rid of water. We said, it turns out water is H2O. And so I'm not getting rid of consciousness or any of the kind of that qualitative feel of consciousness by saying that, it turns out, is a neural process. Who would have thought a neural process could, could you know, be like that? But it, it, it can. So I guess, yeah, maybe that's where I should, I should <coughs> stop. Anil, why is Philip wrong? Oh, <laughs> let me count the ways. Um, <laughs> Well, I think panpsychism is not, is not helpful. I think that's the main thing. I do actually think that there are many 
there's an agreement, there's a, there's an agreement that um, conscious experiences have the particular problem that they are private and subjective. I think we disagree about the extent to which that's a problem, why it's a problem. Right? Yes, it's true that you know, a, a scientific explanation of why red is the way it is and not some other way that can fully predict when people have red experiences and describe them in particular ways and so on will still not give a blind person insight into what it's, full insight into what it's like to have the experience of red. But it will give them some insight in the same way that I can have some insight to what a bat might experience through sonar. Not full insight, but some insight. Only a bat will have full insight. But then I think we're again setting the bar too high. There's no re like having a scientific explanation of what something makes something alive doesn't itself generate life. You know, it, it's, it doesn't instantiate the phenomenon. Um, so I don't think we should necessarily require an explanation of consciousness to do that, to have that like, oh yeah, that I now understand everything about what it would be like to have that experience that I haven't had. Um, so I think materialism can get you very far. I actually wanted to go back to it without rehearsing the whole debate. It's something Rowan said right at the beginning, which is that the resources of materialism are, are perhaps richer than people sometimes imagine. It's not just billiard balls bashing off each other in the void. You know, matter is hugely complicated. Uh, you know, is it fundamentally all about interactions between things? We don't really know. And certainly when you put lots of matter together, really interesting, unexpected things can happen. And I think it's, it's just premature to rule out the kinds of explanations that can be possible before you do the really hard work of running with it as far as we can and saying, let's see how far we get. Maybe there'll be some residue of mystery remaining. Maybe we'll think about the whole problem differently, which would be progress. Or maybe we'll be as satisfied as we are with life, that the previous mystery turned out not to be a mystery in the sense it was originally thought, but just gradually fades away and eventually disappears in a puff of metaphysical smoke. I'm going to give you the last word, Philip, before we move on to the Q&A. Yeah, I so. mean, Anil says it's panpsychism isn't helpful. It isn't helpful if you're doing science, but this is again back to the point. I, I want to distinguish between philosophical explanations and scientific explanations. I actually think his, his analogy about the, the beginning of the universe is, is a good one. A scientist doesn't have to have an opinion on why the universe exists to get on with science, but there's an interesting philosophical question. Why does the universe exist? Is it just a brute fact? Did God create it, whatever? There's the two questions running in parallel, and, and similarly I, I, in the consciousness case. And he seems to be sort of backing down on, on, on explanations. I mean, I think in the case of life, we, we, we do have satisfactory explanations, or you know, the case of water, the chemistry, the chemical explanation of water does give us satisfactory explanation of its properties. Why, do, why, can't we, why can't we expect the same in the case of consciousness? But we know, we know, in that case, physical science can't deal with it. Because, I mean, actually, I mean, like, this is the point I think Laura and I agree on. I mean, I think there's actually 60% of philosophers, there was this recent Phil Papers survey on philosophical opinions, and 60% of philosophers agree with this point that physical and, and mental concepts of the relevant kind are just radically different kinds of concept in, in the way that you're never ever gonna be able to sort of translate from one to the other. I think that's why Laura goes for the view she does. When, you know, philosophers don't agree much, when 60% of philosophers agree on something, I think we should take that seriously. So it's just, it, it's, you're looking in the wrong place to get a physical science explanation of this. That's, that's not what Galileo designed physical science for. It's not what it's ever been good at. It's not the point of it. Just like it's not the point of science to say, why does the universe, why is there something rather than nothing? These are different questions. We need to have proper respect both for science and for philosophy. So I want to thank all of you for just a wonderful conversation about consciousness. It's been really, really fantastic. I think one thing Galileo did design is a fantastic audience for us right in front of us, who's probably gnashing at the bit to ask some really, really important questions to, uh, to you guys, um, Rowan as well. So we've got Jack. He has his boom mic. He's over there. Um, and if you have a question, guys, for us, you... <laughs> I don't think you can hear me. Oh, there we oh, go. There we, go. Yeah, we can hear you now. It's yeah, so wonderful. hot up here. <laughs> so it's, if you have a really question hot. that you would like to ask any of our guests, please just okay. raise a hand. We've got a hand right up at the front. Oh, absolutely. So yeah, I'm go for it. Out. I feel like a... 
budget daytime TV host. <laughs> Do I need to? I'll start running if, um, if as we cl get close to the deadline. Hi, could you please explain to me the difference between uh, panpsychism and idealism? And if there isn't one, could you tell me so that why I'm wrong? So that's questions for Philip, is that correct? Yeah, no, it's yeah. a good question. Very similar views here. So I, the, the way I tend to think of the difference, and the pe people might define them in different ways, idealism is more that there's something underlying the physical universe that's um, purely mental. Um, pure consciousness or mind, whereas panpsychism, as I think of it, is the view that the physical universe is fundamental, it's just that its, its nature is made constitutive forms of consciousness, and um, which might sound kind of strange, so I mean, we haven't really talked about how we make sense of that, and the, 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 in, the thought is that physical science is purely mathematical, which is something you kind of take for granted, but you know, it's our fundamental science is purely mathematical. So, it does, so as long as there is something at the fundamental level that can realize the kind of mathematical structures physicists talk about, then you can kind of get physics out of that. Stephen Hawking had this great line, um, you know, physics doesn't tell you what breathes fire into the equations. So for the panpsychist, it's consciousness that breathes fire into the equations. And that is just, a, you know, a really simple, elegant account of of how um, physics can emerge from facts about consciousness. But anyway, to come back to your question, um, yeah, so panpsychism is the view that the physical universe is fundamental and consciousness is fundamental because they're kind of the same thing. Thank you very much, Philip. Jack, do we have another question? Yeah. <laughs> I've got like loads of questions, but <laughs> I guess Don't we all? the one that feels loudest is, um, what are you hoping to gain from trying to, you know, figure consciousness out and understand it? Is there any particular person you'd like to answer that question? Uh, anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Laura. Okay, um, that's, a really, that's a really good question. Um, I think Rowan would probably be good to answer this one as well, sure. pot potentially. Yeah. But uh, so, I would say that I'm looking for, I, I like simple explanations, and I think physicalism is a very simple explanation. Uh, you have one kind of stuff, and it be, can be put together in different ways to, to create all, you know, tables and trees and, and people. And I guess it, it provides a, an explanation of, I don't know, I'm kind of comfortable with the fact that everything's made of the same kind of stuff. I don't find that really weird at all. I'm quite sort of comfortable with this idea that everything is fundamentally made of the same kind of stuff. So, I mean, I'm just looking at it for, uh, I don't know, an explanation of how to fit consciousness into the physical world, and I think this is the best way of doing it. So that's the reason for me. But you might think it gives you some sort of, I don't know, like homo harmony in some way, that everything's made of the same stuff, perhaps. But I don't know, maybe Rowan could... Well, I'm very that. keen to hear what Rowan's got to say about this. What, what is the point of trying to answer this question, Rowan? Well, let's, let's step back um, just a, a couple of inches from the question um, and think about how these questions tend to get generated. Very often we stop asking tough questions when things aren't working. We want to know why they're not working. And to me, one of the fascinating aspects of neuroscience is how much it, it tackles questions of the malfunction of the brain, how much more understanding we have of certain kinds of condition, um, whether we're thinking of the autism spectrum or dementia, of uh, what happens with stroke patients and so forth, we, we learn a huge amount simply by looking at the mechanics. And I don't find that in the least threatening that we learn about states of mind from looking at what's going on in the brain. And the, the advances in that area are absolutely absorbing, fascinating, and humanly fruitful. But of course, that is just one, to go back to the point I was making earlier, one question along a spectrum of questions which we might want to answer that there are different ways of understanding or explaining consciousness. We might want to think about the ways in which we, we tell stories about ourselves, the pictures we make of ourselves, and understand those better. And we use, of course, not only philosophy, but the arts to explore consciousness in that sense. What's it like to be that kind of person? Uh, because although that doesn't tell me or mirror to me 
what it's like to be me. It gives me the best insight I can have into how some other psychophysical organism works. So I'd say it's a range of problems, a range of issues. On one end of the spectrum is that bundle of questions to do with the actual workings of the brain as, a, as an organic reality, which can help us when things go wrong, when we have to cope with malfunction. At the other end of the spectrum, it can help us when we ask different sorts of questions about how the imagination itself works, how we figure to ourselves the kind of being we are. And yes, I, th I think the usefulness, therefore, is, is of very different kinds. I think if, we, if the goal of it all were to explain it so that we never had to ask any more questions, that would be a deeply worrying and also <laughs> profoundly futile kind of exercise. <laughs> That's not what anybody's after. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rowan. Uh, we've got another question, Mr. Symes. Um, first, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for a great uh, evening and also to the musicians. Um, could Professor Rowan Williams please just clarify his view? What's, what would be your explanation as to why we are conscious? I'm not sure I'm clear so, on that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so what's your view, uh, Rowan Williams? So I think earlier we mentioned, so we mentioned obviously materialism, dualism, and panpsychism. Do you agree with any of those labels at all? I'm not actually enamored of any of the labels because I, I think, as has been said, all of them are compatible with levels of scientific ex explanation. But in answer to the, the question as it was put, I'm not sure I, I find a need to explain consciousness. It's where I start from. I can't think myself into consciousness because I'm already there. I'm asking the question because I'm conscious. And there are all sorts of philosophical um, Mobius strips, you know, patterns that kind of go in and out of each other, which we get into if we, if we fail to recognize that. So I would be interested not so much in where does consciousness come from as in two interrelated things. Um, one, I suppose, is the idea of consciousness as what I called earlier a feedback system. It's how we represent ourselves to ourselves in our world, not just represent our world, but represent ourselves. And there's something about our human, you know, our human nature as such, which has to do with our capacity to represent ourselves, to make pictures of ourselves. And the second thing is, I'm constantly coming back to how Consciousness is not just something that exists like a little seed inside, inside the head that grows all by itself over the years. It is from the very start an interactive linguistic thing. I'm learning from what is said and done to me, from meaningful action performed towards me, including speech. And I become conscious, therefore, in company. And I think there are ways of talking about consciousness which have over the centuries tended to ignore the fact that I, I learn to express and represent what it's like to be me by and through the voices of others and the presence of others. And that's a very significant fact again about what it is to be human. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got our next question. Ready, Jack? Uh, yes, a question to the floor. Um, I recently read that we're never understand what it's like to be a fungus because we're not a fungus and I feel like Neil was about to touch on this with being a bat but I'd like to understand where you draw the line at consciousness and I know we've touched on animals and tables mm. but where do you where do you see the is it plant life got consciousness for fantastic example? question so maybe we can do this to Neil so Neil um, the question is can we know what it's like you mentioned earlier that we can kind of potentially know some of the aspects of what it's like to be a bat mm -hmm. Can we know what it's like to be a fungus? Well, depends whether there is anything it's like to be a fungus. <laughs> I mean, that was the, the question, where you draw the line, right? We agree that tables are not conscious. We agree that we are. Um, where do, is there a bright line where consciousness stops, or does it sort of just gradually gray out into the lack of an inner universe? Um, I think it, that, that's, to, to, it's very, very difficult to say, to say anything particularly sensible about this, because we're, we're faced with, I think, 
one plausible strategy, which is to extrapolate from what we know about humans. That you know, we know we're conscious. I mean, really, I only know that I am, but I can make a reasonable inference that other humans are as well. And, um, and then, how far can we go from that? So we can look at other mammals, primates, monkeys, apes, other mammals, cats, dogs, all share the same sorts of brain structures that we know are implicated in consciousness in humans. So it's very reasonable to think that other mammals are therefore conscious. And a lot of what we know about consciousness in general comes from studies on animals. Um, and we can keep doing that, but it gets really hard the further away uh, you get because things get less similar. When we look at, I spent a lot of time thinking about octopuses, really fascinating creatures to spend time with, but it's like being in the presence of an alien. They are so different. Uh, is there something it's like to be an octopus? Every, everything about my intuition says yes, but on what basis? It's, it's time to examine one's intuitions about that. I think there has to be a place where it does gray out into nothingness. There's uh, simple kinds of nematode worms with 302 neurons. Is that enough? I don't know for sure. Maybe there's a glimmer of, cell, of awareness for a nematode worm, perhaps. But then single-celled organisms, it's very hard to, to imagine there's the necessary stuff to attribute consciousness in any meaningful sense. The danger of this is that we use humans as the template. And the danger of this is, has happened repeatedly in the history of science and thought, where you know, we put ourselves at the top of every pyramid and the center of everything, and then think of everything else as conscious or intelligent or whatever, to, to the extent that it approximates us at the very top. And one way in which that danger gets cashed out is we, we think that intelligence is a benchmark for consciousness. Like, oh, the smarter a creature is, the more likely it is to be conscious. But intelligence and consciousness are not the same thing. You don't have to be smart to suffer. And probably many animals who we would not regard as intelligent by our own questionable standards of human intelligence, given that we're ruining the world, um, may nonetheless have vivid, conscious, subjective lives, mainly emotional, maybe, but meaningful lives nonetheless. So I can't tell you where it grays out into nothingness. I believe that it does, and I believe that's the one strategy we have, but it's a strategy fraught with danger. It's not that your answer was unpopular. I know why people were leaving that. Oh. We're just, uh, <laughs> just because we're, I'm unpopular. <laughs> time has absolutely flew by, and we're already around 9 o'clock. So we've got a question here. There's a question from a gentleman at the front, and then we'll be taking a, a final question. Um, my question's uh, for Neil. You already partially answered it, because I was going to bring up different brain structures, like octopuses and other things like that. But um, just developing on that, do you think that... Um, you could have multiple instances of consciousness in other forms. So, like, you have the um, idea of integrated information theory, where it's, which you see, you're familiar with. So, the, that could suggest that if you integrate that with panpsychism, then there might be a way that offers a physical explanation while incorporating properties of mind in like an emergent way. I just wondered if you thought, because it seems like you were suggesting there is some sort of emergence because you were saying that it would fade at some point, but it also has to come about at some point, which is sort of the same question. That, okay. I guess that's my problem. Okay, I'll just, I'll try and do, there's a lot in that question, so I don't, I'll try and keep it very short. I mean, there's two senses of emergence here. There's emergence like over time, over evolution, and there's emergence like in the moment where the whole is more than the sum of the parts, and that's the kind of emergence that integrated information theory talks about. It kind of depends, so there are some theories that will indeed say that, that uh, consciousness is not purely a property of living systems. Now, this is one of the big open questions, like can only living systems be conscious? Uh, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of hype already about conscious machines, computers, robots. Um, and I'm personally not persuaded by this, partly for the reason I just mentioned, that it's often conflated with intelligence, uh, that people sometimes think that if, as computers just get smarter and smarter, there'll come a point at which the inner lights come on for them, and, they be, and suddenly they're aware. And I just don't, I think that's conflating two different things. There's no reason to think that might happen. But it does depend on which theory of, you know, and, and here I'm talking about neuroscience theories, not the philosophical, metaphysical theories, because even within 
a scientific perspective, you have very different views about what's necessary and sufficient for consciousness. My own view is that it's likely, but not proven, to be a property of living organisms. That it's life that breathes fire into the equations of consciousness, not consciousness breathing fire into the equations of the world. I think they're it's a, it's a really nice, <laughs> elegant phrase, isn't it, that we can abuse in various ways uh, for our own purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Anil. Uh, our next question, Jack. Hi. Uh, I, I guess my question is kind of going back to what you were saying earlier about the fact that physics won't, won't be able to explain consciousness. And I was just thinking, like, when you look at how far we've come as a species in such a relatively short space of time, like we've gone from Galileo <coughs> and in a few relatively short years in the time in terms of the scale of the universe all of a sudden we're understanding uh, consciousness, we're getting to understand consciousness we've got all of the technologies that are out there uh, AI etc so I guess my question is um, are you saying that fundamentally physics or the sciences will, will not be able to explain consciousness or do you think at some point in the future they will be able to I don't my claim is that physical science cannot fully explain consciousness because that's not what it's designed, that's not what it's all about. What physical science is really good at is explaining behavior. You have a complex system, you can explain its behavior postulating a mechanism or ultimately postulating laws of physics. That's what it's wonderful at and we know how to do that well. That's not fundamentally what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to explain behavior, we're trying to explain these invisible subjective qualities that can only be accessed from the inside. It, we're not, and, and so the tools of explaining behavior, it's just, it's the wrong, it's, it's like saying, um, you know, telescopes are really good for astronomy, so probably they'll be really good in pure maths. You know, that's, it's just a different explanatory project. So, so I think it's a, it's a philosophical, conceptual error to, to try and give a physical science explanation of consciousness. But that doesn't mean we won't understand it. In fact, I, I, I you know, Anil's hope will one day explain. I think we've got good explanations, philosophical explanations. And that's, so it's like Sam Harris's mistake saying, we'll explain morality with experiments. That's just confusion. We need a philosophical and a scientific explanation. It's not purely philosophical. Anil's right, we'll get nowhere just sitting in our armchairs. We need to do the experiments but because this is not a publicly observable data, data point, we also need to do the philosophy, combine them together. And yes, we will one day hopefully have a full explanation. And I think the most exciting explanations are where, in my view, panpsychist philosophers who, ha who do have pretty worked out philosophical theories combine with detailed worked out scientific theories um, to bring them both together. But I just think we're going through a phase of history where science, physical science, has gone so well. We're like, oh, that's everything. That's the full story, and it's this wonderful technology. It's gone so well because it's, got, it's, it's aimed at a precise, narrow focus, explaining publicly accessible behavior of systems. But that, that, that's not all the things we want to explain. So we need to return to a proper appreciation of the place of philosophy in finding out about the nature of reality. Thank you very much, Philip, and thank you very much for that lovely question. Uh, is it our last question, Jack? Is that correct? That's all we've got time for, so right. let's go. Uh, this is a question, I think, mostly for Philip. Suppose we had uh, portals into each other's minds, like being John Malkovich. You could go in and you could say, wow, that's what it's like to be you, and oh dear, you're red is my green and vice versa. Suppose, and then suppose that we had this socialized consciousness that we shared and could know about, would there still be no advance to solving the mystery of what that thing is even though it's now socialized? It would still be, there would still be, we'd know more about qualia, but they'd still be mysterious in a deep, sense? That's a really good question. I think it maybe brings out why, like, Anil's sort of agreeing consciousness is private, but then he, th he interprets that as the, well, the problem is it's hard to get the data. You're imagining a, a, a sci-fi scenario where we get all the data, but I, I still think, 
my, my point is a bit different to that. It, is it's, it's, it's the point is it's a, diff, it's a different explanatory project to the normal projects of science. Normally, we're trying to explain experimental data. That's the whole task. Explain the experimental data and we're done. That's fundamentally not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to, we're trying to explain a very different kind of data that we know about in a very different way through just our immediate awareness of our being. So it's, I still think it's a, it's a different, um, th that's why it's, it's not just an experimental question that we can answer with experiments. We'll always have to have a philosophical component to it. But yeah, if we had that device and the philosophy and the science, we could definitely sort it. In the absence of that device, whether we'll ever completely pin it down, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm sure we could go on for hours and hours with questions, guys, but I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. So I'm going to be really demanding at the moment. I'm going to ask if it's okay for three rounds of applause, okay? I would love the first round of applause to be for our wonderful orchestra that have played some amazing music. <laughs> Round of applause number two is obviously with all of the technology we're having, uh, Rowan here as well, and with all of the lights and recording, just a big uh, round of applause for all the people working behind the scenes as well. Please. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, and obviously last but certainly not least is obviously our fantastic speakers, Anil Seth, Laura Gow, Professor Rowan Williams, Philip Goff and Jack Symes as well. Big round of applause for you. And Ollie! And Ollie as well! <laughs> Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed the show. That was really good. Do you want to say we'll be outside signing books? <laughs> yes, absolutely, yes. I think you can go out. You can either go up this way, or you can go out.